Thanks everyone for joining us for this um, Lunch and Learn seminar. Um, it's gonna be short, quick. I'm gonna pull out some findings of this project we're doing. So we'll get started. I am Nita Denson um, and I'm here with my colleagues. I'm presenting on behalf of the team, um, but I have some colleagues here to help answer your questions. Um, my name is Nita Denson and all of us are part of the Center for Resilient and Inclusive Societies. Today, I'm going to talk about Australians well-being and resilience during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, before I get started, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the various lands on which we meet and their custodianship of this country known as Australia. We pay respects and gratitude to elders past, present, emerging and future of the lands we live and work on to their ancestors and to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who may be joining us today. To build resilient and inclusive societies, we must recognize our history. Sovereignty has never been ceded and the destruction and violence caused by colonization are ongoing. We acknowledge Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities longstanding contribution to our collective learning and in building strong, safe and well communities. Um, just a little bit about Chris. Uh, the website is chrisconsortium.org. Please have a look. Um, we're a think tank. We have eight consortium partners. All of the researchers on, on this project are from Western Sydney universities, including myself and Deakin University. We have four research streams and I am part of the Challenging Racism and Enhancing Social Belonging stream. So let's get into it. Uh, this is a national study of Australians, about 1400 Australians, um, 16 years and older. And this was conducted back in November, 2020. We administered an online survey, which is a combination of closed and open-ended questions. Um, we asked about various demographic and background experiences. We also asked about COVID-19 experiences, perceptions and beliefs, such as, have you had COVID? Do you know someone close to you that has had COVID? And belief in COVID-19 mis- and disinformation. We had some, a series of open-ended questions that asked about the impacts of COVID. Um, how has COVID impacted on your employment, living arrangements, social support? We also asked about um, trust. So trust in various information sources, trust in other people, trust in federal and state government. We asked about a number of individual differences variables, differences variables such as intolerance of uncertainty, altruism, narcissism. And then our main outcomes are mental health as measured by the DAS-9, depression, anxiety, and stress scale, uh, the loneliness and resilience. So just to give you a bit of context, um, by October, 2020, Victoria had been in lockdown for 112 days, which was the longest continuous lockdown period in the world at that time. In November, 2020, Australia had almost 28,000 confirmed cases and 900 deaths which if you can think back that far was quite striking compared to the rest of the world. Unemployment was a little less than 7%. And based on the 2008 global financial crisis, it had showed that older populations were more vulnerable to poor health outcomes. And this is mainly due to increased economic stress, which contributed to their declining mental and physical health. So I think at the start of the pandemic, most people were worried, most worried about our older population. Here we are in 2022 and COVID is still a concern. Um, three years on, so in preparation for future crises, these findings should be considered in the context of recovery and boosting resilience of all Australians. So our overall research aim was to examine how Australians are affected by and respond to the pandemic. We had four research questions. Um, what are Australians' COVID-19 experiences, perceptions, and beliefs? What is the perceived impact of the pandemic on Australians? 
What are the factors that promote and hinder Australians well-being and resilience? And did the pandemic affect various populations differently? So because this is a very short talk, I'm gonna just pull out a few key findings, but if you're interested, there'll be a link at the end that you can go to to check out the final report. Okay, so in terms of COVID experiences, um, at that time in November 2020, 1.5% of our respondents had had COVID. And a little over 5% had knew someone who had had COVID. So these are kind of small percentages, um, but there was still an impact on their mental health. So if you look at the figure on the right, um, only 20 people of 20 respondents had had COVID at that time out of 1,400 people, um, but yet it had a significant impact on their mental health and that they had almost, well, they did have double uh, the DAS scores. So higher scores means worse mental health. And then the two bars on the right, there were some vicarious effects. So even just knowing, having someone close to them who had had COVID, um, also had a significant impact on their mental health. We'd ask participants what would be the likelihood that you would contract COVID from a 0% chance to 100% chance. Uh, the mean was a 34% chance that people perceived that they were likely to get COVID. Um, and this was the correlation of that last question, what would be the likelihood, had a small but significant correlation with all of our outcomes, so mental health, loneliness, and resilience, it was about 0.1 to 0.2, but still significant. In terms of trust, we had asked Australians um, five questions on their perceptions of how the government has been handling uh, and responding to COVID. So the purple bars relate to the federal government, and then the green bars are state government. So these responses were on a seven point scale from strongly disagree to seven strongly agree. So overall, back in November, 2020, Australians were fairly happy um, in that they somewhat agreed. That's the five, the five scale, the five on the seven point scale that the governments were doing a good job during COVID and keeping them informed. Um, what's worthy here to note is that the green bars are slightly higher. So overall, um, the respondents were a little bit more happy with the state government as compared to the uh, federal government. We also asked participants about the various media formats that they consulted to obtain their COVID-19 information. So the purple bars are um, how often they access these sources from one not at all to seven very often. And then the green bars are the perceived accuracy of those sources from one completely inaccurate to seven completely accurate. So the most sources that people, the respondents tended to access were commercial TV or radio, and then followed by print or online newspaper as well as state or federal government websites. So in general, the respondents are accessing TV, radio, newspapers, as well as this, the government websites. Um, but you can see that in terms of perceived accuracy, respondents who are believe that the state and federal government websites were definitely the most accurate. In terms of social media, 45% of the respondents, so almost half, said that they did not use any social media at all as a source of COVID-19 information. However, almost as many, 42 respondents, so two out of five people, reporting use, using Facebook to access their COVID-19 information. So maybe something we should be worried about. Um, we also asked respondents about their COVID-19 beliefs and mis- and disinformation. So we asked them 10 questions, and at the time, some of these were um, ideas that had been propagated in the media, um, various sources. So we have 10 statements here and the majority of respondents disagreed with eight of the 10 statements. So the bottom eight. 
There was some support around the first two statements. If you look at the purple and blue proportions, so um, over 50% either agreed or neither agreed nor disagreed that COVID-19 was created by the Chinese as a weapon to be used against Western countries and that it is a bioengineered virus. So remember this was back in November, 2020. Another thing I'd like to point out is um, about halfway down, 20%, so one out of five of our respondents um, believe that face masks did not prevent the spread of COVID and that it also impeded on their personal freedom. We also examined the differential impact and we looked across various demographic and background characteristics. We looked across gender, looked for any differences across gender, country of birth, Anglo background, age, employment, state, remoteness, living arrangements, whether or not they had a disability or disabilities, and whether they were impacted negatively by the 2019, 2020 bushfires. So, because very short for time, I'm only going to present on some of the main ones here, which are young people. We found um, that young people were pretty adversely affected by COVID students and the unemployed, as well as single people, and in particular, single people living with their parents and family. So look first at age. And so we had kind of three broad outcomes. So the top left are the DAS-9 scores. This is mental health, depression, anxiety, and stress. So higher scores means poor mental health. Then we have loneliness in the top right. So higher scores indicate greater loneliness. So for the top two figures, higher scores means or relate to poor outcomes. And then in the bottom is the resilience. So higher scores is better. So higher scores um, reflects greater resilience. So the pattern of findings across the top two are, are pretty similar in that those who are younger have poor mental health as compared to older people. Um, younger people also are more lonely as compared to those in the older age groups. And then the, the similar pattern is reflected in resilience on the bottom and that younger people tend to have lower resilience as compared to older people. So now these are the graphs separated by employment status. So not, uh, perhaps not surprisingly, students have been the worst affected. So students, <clears throat> and they're followed closely by the unemployed. So students and the unemployed tend to have the highest death scores, they're the most lonely, and then they're also less resilient as compared to everyone else. And then by living arrangements, um, I think what surprised me a bit was that couples living without children tended to do quite well during the pandemic in that um, they had the lowest rates of mental health issues. Um, they were the least lonely um, and they were also the more, most resilient. But similar to before, um, the single persons, single people, um, and single people living with their parents and their family who are most commonly the youngest, um, less than 25-ish, um, are still living at home with their parents and family. They had poor mental health, they're more lonely, and they were the least resilient. So that was a snapshot of the findings. Uh, younger people were impacted the most negatively by the pandemic. Uh, they were less resilient than older people. And they also had poor mental health and were more lonely as compared to older people. Uh, this specific impact of the pandemic was, was a bit unexpected, given that older people had a much higher risk of health issues associated with COVID. So given this risk, Older people were often advised to self-isolate and socialize less, but I think we, we you know, it was kind of unexpected um, that we focused on older people um, when it was actually the younger people that were struggling the most. So 
While numerous studies confirm a statistically significant difference by age, the correlation between age and resilience is comparatively weak in that they're actually quite small effect sizes. These most of the correlations in, in research that has come out now on the pandemic shows that they're around 0.1 to 0.3, the correlation between age and resilience. And in our study, the correlations between age and all three of our outcomes were between 0.2 and 0.3. So still around there. Um, there is emerging research that suggests that younger people are less resilient than older people. But why is that? One explanation is that they could be more vulnerable to stress, less emotionally stable, and less tolerant of ambiguity than older people. So this may have something to do with age effects and maturity, and perhaps older people have developed better psychological coping mechanisms and our social support systems, which makes them more resilient. However, this evaluation is a bit too simplistic. An alternative theory is that younger people are facing unique and diverse stressors. So Michael Ungar, who's also part of, of Chris, um, he's kind of one of the big names in the resilience field. He, he asked us to focus on, um, to move away from the individual and actually focus on what happened to individual lives that made them different from what would be expected given the amount of stress they have experienced. So he's trying to move us away from the individual towards a multi-systemic understanding of the interactions between two or more systems, for example, between people and their environments. So I'll go into more detail at my Taza presentation, shameless plug, <laughs> um, while I'll be presenting on this a bit more. Uh, but basically, younger people are even more disadvantaged because they're not only young, but they're more likely to be student or unemployed and more likely to be living with their parents or family. For example, um, this graph here on the bottom right shows that, and this is based on the qualitative data, but thank you, Dan, for <laughs> tabulating all of this. Um, younger people, 18 to 34 years old, actually reported the most change to their employment. And younger people are definitely more likely to live with their parents and family. In our, in our study, it was 79% of 16 to 17 year olds live with their parents and family. And 63% of singles who are living with their parents and family um, are under 35 years of age. The qualitative comments also point to the pandemic as having negative impacts on their social support and social lives. So that is it. And any questions, be happy to take them. And if you'd like to read the full report, there's a QR code and follow us, follow me. Thank you. Now I ask a question to us, Lita. Sure. I reckon um, the one of the really interesting things that came out of this report was that focus on on young people um, in terms of those mental health and well-being um, factors. But I'm wondering, I mean, we have talked about this a little bit, but why was there that focus? Like why were young people missing, I guess, from government responses um, in this way, do you think? Because there was definitely a tendency towards, you know, that focus on the older age groups. Yeah. At and the, it's hard. almost at the expense of the younger. Yeah, I younger agree. Ones. And I think, right, I'm trying to trying to think back because at the beginning when we're seeing the case numbers, infection numbers, death numbers, it was mainly concentrated in the older populations and the older age groups. But it's we're two years on now, right? And we can see it kind of evolve, like as the strains kept changing, kept as the new variants kept coming out, then the, it seemed to kind of shift more towards the younger people. But then it was also conflated with the time where we were starting to open up the lockdowns and it was actually the younger people that were out in those service industry roles. So there's so much um, that has happened since then. I think we learned, well, it's hard to, to remember because <laughs> these past few years have been a blur. But it does seem like at the beginning, we we just focused on the older people because they were the ones that were suffering and dying and being infected the most at the beginning. Yep. So I think we just we just weren't prepared because we yeah. haven't seen anything like this. Yeah. 
Yeah. I guess it was a, a response to almost a medicalized response, wasn't it? The most immediate thing that was happening was people being sick and, and dying. Yeah. Rather than thinking about those long term impacts of, of yeah. mental health and well being. And they're like, don't visit, you know, your grandma and grandpa. Remember that rhetoric? Like, don't, mm. don't see them safe, you know, keep them safe. Yeah. So I think it, it's just changed. Should I just, there's a couple of questions that have come in on the Q&A, Nita. Maybe I'll just read them out. Does that seem like Yeah, yeah. Um, so just Vivian said it's excellent project um, comment rather than a question. She just said she's surprised that people in share houses has, had such high levels of loneliness. Thanks, Vivian. Um, I was wondering about this too, actually, and I had gone and kind of dug into the data a bit. So what surprised me is that I looked at the demographics of people in share houses and 54% of people in share houses were 55 years and over. Okay. So yeah, which surprised me because in my head, I thought they'd be like 20 something, you know, younger, younger people. Um, so so 42% were in the 25 to 54 year age range. Only 4% were 24 years and younger. But so that surprised me a bit as well, is that 54% were 55 years and above. So my guess is perhaps, I mean, I, I, I can only speculate because I don't have this data, but my guess is maybe they're not as close with their families and maybe that's why they're in a share house. I, I honestly don't know, but it's definitely something worth looking into. But I agree. The share houses also too surprised me a bit. Mm. There's another one um, from Mark uh, Duthworth, just Duckworth, sorry, just saying that in 2021, trust in government collapsed following that increase in trust that we saw in 2020. Um, what do we think some of the reasons were for this? Oh, good question, Mark. <laughs> um, thank you, fellow <laughs> Chris, Chris people for coming to this. Um, yeah. So, yeah, again, because we, we did, we've done a couple other studies since then, and I, it, it's interesting to see the evolution of trust and how it's changed over the pandemic. Like at the beginning, um, and I, I remember feeling this too, like we were kind of felt like we were all in this together and we were okay with the, the extreme lockdown measures. But I think as the world started opening up and then we got kind of left behind, I think that's when people started getting a bit um unhappy with the response and I mean we're a country of migrants I have my funny accent uh quite a few people do and I think being cut off from the rest of the world was a, a big thing uh but again I'm just uh based it's not based on this study obviously because it was just conducted in 2020 end of 2020 but it seems that's my sense since then that maybe that's a contributor Mm. Did you want to add anything, Rachel or Daniel? I was just going to um, say on the back of um, another project that we're involved in, Nita, that has looked at trust as well, that um, partially I think with something like the COVID pandemic is is the timeline as well. Like so, you know, we're not talking about um, a, an event or or even a, a series of events that were like, you know, over six months, we're talking about something that's dragged on now for three to four years. And I think the length of it and the changing dynamic within that, Time frame as well of government responses and how they've been reported, et cetera, might have some um, bearing on that. And then the other point I was just going to make is that that's a trend that we've seen globally as well. There was lots of, um, you know, there was lots of rising in, in trust towards governments globally, I think, in that first year, which we saw yeah. more or less dive, um, as Mark's pointed out in 2021, or not dive, but it has gone down in 2021, 2022. Yeah, across many countries, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, just, yeah. just maybe to sorry daniel yeah you go um yeah maybe just to add um a slightly more victorian um personal experience sort of um angle to it from from here in 2021 um it's fairly speculative about you know how this would fare in terms of theories of trust but i remember that when the second long lockdown um hit over here there was a sense at least around um, people close to me that whatever plan there was in 2020 and whatever sort of, um, you know, there, there's definitely a lot of mess, but at some point it was sort of streamlined. And then with the second one, there's definitely another hit that people were not quite sure um, where, that will, where that will lead, how long it would take. And it really seemed like there was no plan for a lot, mm -hmm. of, a lot of the time. 
um, and I remember also protest um, against the Andrews government and so on when this was really prolonging. Um, so yeah, just to add that. Mm. Um, I mean, speaking of the Andrews government, I remember reading some comments in this research about people calling them draconian laws and all this kind of aspect. So it was really a um, stress in that regard. But I think, yeah, the difference is that 2021 and now 2022, it feels like it's just a quick succession of constant stresses that are currently happening in the world. So it's like a dam is just starting to crack as it comes more and more. And with our our COVID response in that it very much became a point of as kind of Jonathan was saying and things like that like we were constantly adapting and never quite sure what the new rules were as it as there was opening up in different um states different countries were opening up at different rates so I think this just include made a larger um confusion across the board basically mm. plus all the other kind of dramatic um issues that were happening with our parliament at the time and that I assume would also <laughs> impact our trust in the government at the time as well. Yeah. I wonder, Nita, we've just got one last live question. I know we've only got a, bin, a minute or so left, yeah. so I'll just ask this one quickly. Um, Christine's just asked what we can learn for the future and for, for pandemic responses more generally. Oh, that's, that's, that's the big question. <laughs> and I'm happy for my colleagues to, to help me here. Oh, for me, I think I think it was well. It's becoming more apparent as we're going on that younger people need a lot of support. Like I think more than we thought they they would. Like I think we're even seeing. We don't have data on this, but children right in primary and secondary schools also um, suffered quite a bit through COVID, and I I don't think we were just prepared for that at all because none of. I mean, it is unprecedented unprecedented. And I heard that word so many times in March and April of last year. Um, I Yeah, we, we really got to focus on young people. Um, I don't know if anyone else had any others. Yeah, sure. I'm happy to add a little bit. Um, definitely um, the importance, I think, from our data of tackling mis and disinformation as soon as possible. And we could see the different impacts that um, this has had for people who believe in conspiracy theories mm. and so on, the impact that this um, has had on mental health um, and other uh, negative impacts based on our surveys. There's also the part on mental health, um, mental health support and targeting because we really managed with this data to um, map the demographics of people who, um, who had poor mental health or were more strongly affected and then trying to target and customize the support that people from particular groups um, receive. That's another thing we have in here. Um, also maybe enhancing social support, trust, um, community connections. So obviously there's a lot of civic, um, civil organizations that are involved. That was another part there in the sort of last section of the, of the conclusion that is worth following up on. Thanks, Jonathan. <clears throat> yeah, the QR link is there, so please have a read. Any last minute thoughts, anyone? Well, thank you all for coming. And thank you, colleagues, for joining me.